There is the true version and there is the humiliating version. I'm going to give you the true version. Three versions of the truth. My version, his version, and the truth. Uh. <laughs> How many, how many young musicians, uh, as I still consider myself a young musician, mm. today have the chance of being taken under the wing by an old master? The first validation that I got was his uh, <coughs> encouraging me to write these uh, fragments. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, uh, the results uh, were so uh, interesting to me and uh, last of all uh, that uh, people are responding to it. kept in touch and he faxed me these things. So I have a stack of faxes of, I mean, it's great, I take great care of them. I That's a little bit exaggerated, huh? You don't have no stack like that. If it's stack like this, baby. That's like a dictionary side, really. Uh, still, uh, they're just uh, like things that I like to do without thinking of uh, publishing them or mm -hmm. making a career out of playing them. I still play all the things you are uh, on my gigs and things like that. So I really appreciate that encouragement and and I, have, I just told him I have a whole bunch of fragments waiting to <laughs> drop in the fax machine for the next project. It's like that, and there's so much stuff. There's, there's so much material, and it's and it's surprisingly varied. It's not this linear mon monotonous material it's very very diverse so there is really a whole lot to look for I did take great care in trying to custom the arrangements to what Lee wants uh, I overburdened him at the beginning with just writing and a bunch of material that would just be too much to, uh, to deal with and as I start to understand how he functions as an improviser, a musician, as, uh, in general, I am able to address more specific the, the way, the process, his creative process. I write uh, uh, from uh, just hearing something without an instrument, or I, when I play uh, my horn, I, play a phrase that I like and I jot it down and go from there with the instrument basically or sitting at the piano and improvising and coming up with something. So I have three uh, motivations so to speak. Since Lee is such a, a contrapuntist, I don't know how else to say it, um, it seems to be connecting. Mm. There's all these lines that happen all the time, and I think that's more specific to, to, to Lee's point. listening to a woodwind a little section rehearsal I never heard that before I've listened to these arrangements quite a few times and there's always something to hear you know and especially listening to some of my themes they sound uh, I even asked them about a tune once over the phone and I, um, I had made some corrections on this sheet and I said, uh, what do you think of this one? He said, we recorded that already. <laughs> I said, damn. <laughs> we just curious as the first day and giving it his best and giving me a chance immediately, not asking. It's just gobbling the music and be interested.
was just thinking of uh, the, this collaboration uh, phenomenon. Uh, the uh, Billy Strayhorn, Duke Ellington, Miles with Gil Evans. Uh, who else? Uh, those two especially. I was just uh, kind of uh, browsing uh, through a book on uh, Billy Strayhorn because I wondered. Uh, I know that Duke Ellington couldn't have written and arranged all that music. Yeah? Mm. Uh, and uh, everybody that seems to know insists that he did. And I can, won't believe it. Uh, Billy Strayhorn was the, the workhorse in that uh, situation. And, uh, uh, well, Miles, uh, you know, had many facets to his career. That was just one of them. But uh, he encouraged Gil to prepare these great uh, settings for him, and that worked. Big Band project, actually, the whole repertoire of the Big Band has a, an intent, which is to um, to go from the earlier composing side of Lee, from including Sound Lee, which was one of the earlier pieces he wrote, and going and exploring all these different um, aspects, compositionally and you know different settings for improvisation. So, you know, a very straight ahead, if you can call it straight ahead, arrangement of Sound Lee, exploring. <laughs> it's <laughs> like straight ahead. <laughs> No, the very free, going to the very free moments of um, Ornetti, going to um, a, a more European, uh, like we'll get there probably a relative major, going to uh, exploring the different passages and more like a journey through time of, uh, of all the things that he is able to extrapolate. Mm -hmm. out of. <laughs> Started that I put the date on uh, the little pieces I uh, write, and that was th at that date. And uh, I uh, started the, the phrase with the uh, three, five, eight uh, phrases. Something mm -hmm. with that kind of feeling, which he changed right away. It was <laughs> too complicated. <laughs> Juno 5 is a difficult piece, was the most difficult piece for me to, to work on because it has a chameleon personality. It had this over the bar line figure, these groups of five and seven. It's very nice, but it's not a, a symmetrical way of writing. And if I had, with all due respect, gone that way, I think it would have been too complex. And it would defeat the purpose of you know, writing it for the
goes from one place to another and it journeys within different styles. Mm. Uh, and the only real thread besides Lee is the, the melodic fragments, which I just, I light them in certain ways stylistically. It's straight eighth, really swinging Thad Jones, Mel Luisi style, salsa, open piano solo free. Mm. It just jumps here and there and it's just these, these groups of five eighth notes, seven eighth notes. Um, that I use as, as the bridge between all these. Uh, I uh, certainly encouraged Ohad to change anything that he felt. Uh, I usually wrote it. Sometimes I didn't even put the harmonies so I mm. could get it. He wanted some things. Uh, I just threw them in the machine and then the next day I looked at them and added something here, distracted, subtracted something there, etc. So that was the working process. Mm. Actually, it was a, a long piece that started in C minor and ended in E flat major, hence the relative major, going the other way. Started dark and ended brighter. I never do that. It's very nice. So it's, it was a ve it's a very long piece. It's a 64 bars form. And if you could see the, the three or three pages or four pages, is full. He's even written out at my request the melody with the chords, so I have some reference uh, to the, the melody. And uh, it's just black and white, up the kazoo, as they say. And I'm trying to, you know, see it and everything. And that's a practical look at it. But uh, musically, it's just a very uh, interesting culmination of this uh, getting together. Uh, it was a kind of an ABA or ABC form, so it was very thought out. The first part in minor, the, the, the bridge, if you want, as a rubato with, with no time, strict time pulse. And then the third part, a contrasting material to the first part, but in a different key with a different feel. It's very well thought out. Mm. You know, he's very modest, being modest, I think he's <coughs> very thorough with the, the composing aspect, which is an, a very underrated side. Everybody. I mean, especially now, I've noticed in New York now starts playing Lee's tunes more and more subconsciously. These, you know, lines that he wrote in the 1800s. But the, uh, the, uh, the he's uh, just kidding, folks. Uh, not the <laughs> 1800s. <laughs> but in in the case on that of this particular line, the relative major, uh, very detailed, very detailed. When the, you know, chord changing is happening happening at a specific moment, and uh, what it. Uh, the impression I got from this was the, almost a, a European feel, so that's why I explored the more European contemporary side with this mass of sound punctuating the beginning and the end, this uh, very thick 12 voice chorale that is just moved as a big texture as opposed to just single lines, you know. And crispy uh, melody that uh, is very diatonic and yet moves abruptly from one place to the other and is very swinging. Mm. Uh, you called it Ornetti actually, I think the facts you, you wrote oh, it, yeah. you, you, you did call it Ornetti. And uh, oh, I think it's, I mean just the, coming with that shape, this is really a very unique shape. There's so much food in it that you, you know, you can extrapolate. It's the thing is he doesn't realize I think Lee to some extent how much, how rich the stuff he has.
problem is that uh, for me, uh, the, 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 with that kind of a texture, that kind of uh, uh, intensity in the theme, you're supposed to follow it up. Uh, that was the problem in the, the early days, playing the uh, Tristano kind of uh, eighth note lines. Before the first chorus was over, the intensity was way up here, and then you took over and supposed to raise it higher. When you play the melody, or the standard melody, you can start down here and build up, etc. I can't uh, follow up that theme too much. Just sent it to me on September 11th, <laughs> but it was a beautiful melody. I mean, it's a it's a gorgeous, gorgeous line. These, like I said, these uh, these ballads that he sends. Uh, actually, for, uh, this th th that particular piece, he uh, it didn't have chords in it. I think. No, it was just a melody without the chords, or just a few chords here and there. You mm -hmm. said that the things should go here and then, and then. Um, And then the arrangement embeds it in between the two Ornetti, just to as a contrasting element. Of course, it's going to now create a, a historical question mark. Of September 11, Lee Konitz has been very influenced by the events. And And uh, I was supposed to uh, come the next month to play three nights uh, with Paul Motion, a duo at the, the Shapiro Center, the Lincoln Center thing. And I said, gee, I, why would I do that? Uh, people are suffering like that. They don't want to hear two guys uh, making up some... And I went because uh, I wanted to do it. And, after playing for an hour, I said, gee, for one hour, people don't have to think about that tragedy. So it felt uh, very functional somehow. That's how high the bar is placed when he improvises. He's one of rare breed of true improvisers. I mean, and that's what sets him apart, I think, from the vast majority of what's going on in the jazz world. He truly improvises, he truly opens it up and dances. It's a high, how do you call that, um, a tightrope number. He's always take. he's never going to take the shortcut, never. Which oftentimes you fall on your face, but in Lee's case, not that often. And it, uh, magic is achieved a whole lot of time. talk to the kids, uh, I point out that uh, I have uh, a little more assurance from having done it for a long time, so that they can do that too if they can hang in long enough. <laughs> Playing by eye, so to speak, when you have to look at the sheet, trying to do it correctly and everything. As soon as I close my eyes and start to play, I don't know where I am on the sheet. So I'm looking for him to give me a, a cue. But uh, the most important thing, and this starts with our obligation, our desire to play with whomever we're playing with, to listen to them and react and hopefully uh, mutually respond. The first thing for me always is the fact that uh, uh, someone invites me to do a, be a part of a project, because that's uh, pretty much how I work all the time. 
If people wouldn't invite me, I'd be home practicing a lot. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. And then I see how hard these guys are willing to work and have to work to play this music because it's difficult. And, uh, you know, this isn't uh, uh, world-class musicians thrown together like you find in New York. Uh, what happens with the world-class musicians in New York, they sound like a bunch of world-class musicians who are thrown together for that situation. Mm. Uh, these, uh, we haven't had enough opportunity to work yet to make it really relaxed uh, and completely functional and effective. But uh, for me to see all these guys uh, uh, so serious, uh, it's very inspiring. Great experience witnessing these guys completely and fully dedicated and having a complete grasp on the, that jazz world, the jazz vocabulary, just being their own. You know, I, I, I think it's admirable. And, and that, 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 this, this particular project at Matosinos Orchestra is, is a great example of what's right in the music. Yeah. that I was going to live forever. Uh, that was my rationale for not practicing enough. <laughs> so I got time. I can do an hour today and an hour. When I hear about Coltrane practicing eight hours a day and Bird practiced 15 hours a day the first few years. And anyway, just thought I'd interject that. You can cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anything else you wanted to talk about? Or? Yeah. I wanted to say that I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> no, nothing else. Workshop in Geneva where Ohad was living at the time, and uh, I commented that his foot was out of sync with his fingers when he was playing. And uh, someone recently commented to me that my foot was out of sync with my fingers, and I said, God, yeah. sometimes you just never learn.